All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of D Suite Nation. Uh, tonight is very, very special. We're going to do things a little bit different tonight because of the topic. I'm going to be handling most of the uh, the MC slash hosting duties, and we're going to let Ray be more of a uh, a, 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 a participant in the conversation uh, than he usually is um, because of the topic. Kind of kind of a, a sensitive topic to some, uh, but it's a topic that's been out there in the news lately, fits right into what we at D Suite Nation want to do. It's, uh, we're going to talk about Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, uh, his uh, being left off the dream team, and then we're going to get into some, uh, some Bulls rivalry uh, with the Pistons, uh, bad boys, Bulls rivalry talk uh, from the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and we're going to get into that stuff. Uh, with us today, we got two very special guests. Uh, one gentleman you might have recognized before from uh, season one of our show, uh, Flint Central graduate, played basketball at Campbell University. Uh, Mr. George Miller is in our, uh, our bottom right there with the Raiders hat on. And uh, <laughs> seated, seated next to him is his brother, uh, Flint Central graduate as well. Uh, U of Michigan, University of Michigan graduate, uh, former Flint Central, Flint Northern High School basketball coach, Marcellus Miller. All right. How you guys doing today? Good. 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 Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. All right. And next to me, obviously you guys know him, Mr. Ray Asensio. How you doing today, Ray? Get him, Ray. He's coming out swinging. He's coming out swinging. Like I said, guys, we cut... Come out, no dirty blows. Come out, touch gloves, and let's have a good fight, okay? Clean fight. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so first thing we're going to talk about. We all have seen, it's been on TV, everybody's talking about it, the last dance documentary uh, with Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And uh, a big part of that documentary and a big part of that discussion was the, the Pistons' rivalry and years of battling with the Bulls and also the dream team and a controversial part from that dream team is our beloved Isaiah Thomas was uh, excluded from that dream team so uh, I'm sure everybody is aware you know Isaiah Thomas was not selected to that 92 dream team where Chuck Daly was the coach um, so let's just uh, let's kick it off there let's go around and, and kind of give your opinion as to maybe why you think that that uh, occurred. We'll start with you, George. Well, um, I think I'm in the mindset of most basketball connoisseurs that Isaiah's talent definitely warranted him being on that team. And I always ask that question of why he wasn't just with, you know, right after the, the bad boys championships and things like that. Uh, I think what we're seeing now, it was more of behind the scenes. It was never the talent thing. He kind of had a few things going on with multiple people on the team. And the quite ironic thing about it is Chuck Daly was his guy. And honestly, I don't think Chuck Daly even fought for him to be on that team just because of what it would have done the camaraderie to that team. That, that team was special, obviously. Uh, you have some aging veterans that were on that team, but the fact that their name, and obviously they could still play, it made that team special. But the camaraderie as we see it, you know, they've done the specials on them, just the dream team-wise, and, of course, the last dance showing it. They really got close, and that's the aspect I, you know, truly don't – we don't know if that would have been there. We don't know if it could have helped them – kind of correct the things or get over the Isaiah component because obviously they're still, you know, holding on to that. And we're, man, we're 28 years later. I mean, it's, it's a long time, but we, we will never know, unfortunately. But I think, you know, that was big reason that he wasn't on that team, definitely not for talent-wise. And anybody, I don't, I haven't found anybody that would argue me on that one saying that his talent didn't warrant him making that, you know, 12-man team. And, well, 11-man team and that other Duke guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of people are going to agree with you on that, George. I don't think anybody <laughs> anybody will say Isaiah Thomas wasn't talented enough to be on that team. Yeah. There was one person that said that, one. and you can YouTube it. Okay, YouTube it. Or I don't trust anything else they say. There's, a, there's an interview with Clyde Drexler and Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen said that there's no room for him, and he wasn't good enough to be on the team. So he's the only person in the world that said that. Yeah, I, I could. I don't. I believe you that that happened. We, Obviously, I mean, it's we on didn't YouTube. Go into all that, but I'm just saying no. there is one person that yeah. lived on this earth that actually the words came out of his mouth, and it was Scotty. Yeah, Pippen. yeah, but I could see. I could see Scotty Pippen saying that, not believing it himself, just saying it just to dig a knife in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Marcellus, what's your what's your opinion on? I think, man, you know, just piggybacking off of uh, what George said, I think is a combination of things. You know, just starting with Chuck Daly where you where you kind of left off at the fact that Chuck didn't advocate for Isaiah is a big deal um being a coach of that team you would think you're gonna put your guy on the team no matter what but Chuck didn't but if, if there's a I know this last dance documentary is uh Jordan said he wasn't the one but there's a uh, there's a reporter old reporter for Sports Illustrated Jack McCallum who said that Jordan told him back in 2011 that he told that Jordan told Rod Thorne if Isaiah was on the team he wasn't playing so you know who do you believe in that regard and I know Scotty you know I know Scotty my boy man and uh Scotty was uh dead set against Isaiah he he said it they did a documentary on NBA TV um just a uh I don't know eight years ago or so and I think it was what the 20 you know around the 20-year reunion and uh, he was basically like, we didn't want him. I didn't want him. And they asked him specifically about Mike. And he just smiled and said, well, I can't speak for Mike. But I don't think Mike wanted him either. So um, it was that. And then Magic, I think, is the component that we forget about. Magic got upset because when he made that HIV announcement, the rumor was that Isaiah said some things about it because they used to care <coughs> for the game. And so Isaiah got to questioning his sexuality. So... They uh, basically the the rumor is Magic said I didn't want him. Carl didn't want him. Nobody wanted him. So Isaiah, you know, Shannon Sharp said this recently, and I'll turn it over. Shannon Sharp said his grandmother used to tell him, "Be careful whose toes you step on, because that same foot is gonna be connected to the leg that's connected to the butt that you're gonna have to kiss later on." Yep. So yep. you gotta be careful. And Isaiah, he just he burned some bridges. And and him and Magic is reconciled with a, two years ago, which is good, but you know time time got away from him, you know, and it, it's unfortunate because like George said, he deserved to be there talent wise, no doubt about it. Yeah. All right, Ray, what what do you think? Um, you know, both of them kind of touched upon a lot of things that I was gonna say. Uh, uh, like the Chuck Daly thing. Uh. You know, the reason he, I mean, the reason that he was a unanimous pick to be the head coach is because Isaiah Thomas, you know, because of his leadership and what Isaiah did. Because that bad boys team, I, you know, Isaiah's the only all NBA 50 player that led his team to championships, like before the year 2000. Mm -hmm. like, like Michael had a teammate, all, uh, everybody, Larry, Bill Russell, everybody had at least one teammate except for Isaiah. Isaiah's the reason. Chuck Daly was the coach of that team. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, as far as Chuck Daly goes, um, he, he preached team. The Pistons were a team. Um, I don't think he uh, really campaigned for Isaiah either, trying to get him on, but I, I kind of understand why he didn't. Mm -hmm. Because like George said, you know, you don't want to mess up the chemistry. And, and Chuck Daly was assigned to coach a team. So that means for this summer, this is my team and this is my commitment. So I'm not really, I'm not upset. I don't agree with it because I would have campaigned for, for Isaiah, but, but, but Isaiah is the reason Chuck Daly uh, coached that team. And, and another thing, I, I never felt that, uh, and I'm, I'm only basing my, my judgments on interviews like I've seen the Pistons like over the years. I, 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 really, uh, I really don't think that Michael and Isaiah like dislike each other like the world thinks they do right now. I think both of them, because you got to remember, Isaiah and Michael are businessmen. Now they're not players; they're businessmen. They're kind of like they're kind of like the Floyd Mayweather's of basketball. 
they're, they're, I think they're playing everybody for a fool right now. They're not – now, they're not best friends, okay? They're not best friends. Was Isaiah, like, the best man in Michael's wedding? No, probably not. I don't think that they dislike each other like they're portraying themselves to be. And I honestly feel that uh, Marcellus brought up – or both these guys brought up Magic Johnson. Um, I think that during that time, the, the, the insensitive remarks that Isaiah made about his, uh, his HIV virus – and uh, his, like, you know, his uh, sexuality being in question. Um, I think that was uh, more so than the not shaking the bull's hands. I think that was a deciding factor. Obviously, Lamb uh, Larry Bird isn't going to campaign for Isaiah after, you know, when he piggybacked Dennis Rodman's comments about him being a white player and if he was black, he, whatever. But, um, no, from, a, I mean, yeah, like you guys said, from a skill set standpoint, I mean, at, you know, Isaiah was uh, Isaiah was probably still in 92, probably a top eight or top nine player in the league, maybe. And, uh, you know, for, you know, who's to say that he wasn't good enough to start on that team? You know, only because Magic uh, was a little, you know, kind of more past his prime than like, you know, Michael and Isaiah. But, um, yeah, there's uh, there's I'm not mad at Chuck Daly. I think Magic was the reason. And um, because you did you George and Marcellus did you guys watch that interview that uh, where Magic and Isaiah sat next to each other and they kind of rekindled their relationship? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember, okay, remember when uh, Magic apologized to him? He said, "I apologize for the things I've done in the way that I hurt you." I think mm -hmm. he was talking about the Dream Team. That's what I th the Dream Team thing. Oh, no, question, no question about it. Things. See, Magic's the one that apologized. Mm -hmm. So. But but Magic actually went on record. I just seen this about two hours before we got on uh, film here, that uh, uh, Stephen A. and Max Kellerman asked him, Magic, John Stockton or Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson clearly said that uh, Stockton, he didn't say it literally, but he basically said Stockton couldn't hold Isaiah's jockstrap at that time. If Isaiah should have been on the team and not John Stockton, Mag Magic actually said that. But. That's what. That's how I feel about that. I don't think Mike and Isaiah dislike each other like you get, like people think. I really don't. Despite what they've been saying, you know, they, they right. see dollar signs, man. Right. Now, so that's what I think. Uh, well, I hear you, Ray, but <laughs> I see Mike's face. Mike's face was nothing fake about it. He's like, I don't want to hear nothing. He said, "Of course, Isaiah's gonna say I." He is still. He still feels disrespected to the point he's like, "Magic, come to me." Way you know, pass on. We beat them, and I had to get beat by you for so long. Yeah, and I had to come shake your hand even after you beat me in that game seven. And then the next year we kick your butt, and you just walk out on me. Jordan yeah. does not let things go easy. No, I'll tell you no. right. No, they, and it showed they, that it showed that in the documentary when uh, when Clyde Drexler made those comments before the I think it was the ninety two finals when he you know and Jordan it was. Jordan was dead set against making him look foolish in that, that first game. Uh, but my opinion on this is, while I, while I think it's a travesty, like most people do, that Isaiah Thomas wasn't on that team, I think it's, I think it's a bed that he made and had to lie in. You know what I mean? The, those bad boys, Pistons, they didn't make any friends, right? There was a lot of consequences from their actions. They had, they had beef with the Celtics, the Lakers, the Bulls. You know, and then the walk-off thing, I think that's all – there's consequences to your actions, you know. Isaiah had – you know, he had, he had beef with half the guys on that team, you know. You know, Michael, Pippen, uh, Magic, Bird, Stockton, Malone, the, he had beef with all those guys, or him along with the bad boys, right, as bad boys had beef with half the team. So they were, they were concerned about chemistry, you know, and Michael brought it up uh, during that, that documentary. It was just like – Talent wise, does Isaiah deserve to be on the team? Yes, but he would have come on that team and changed the entire chemistry of the team, right? Because they were all buddy buddy hanging out, having a good time, um, and things like that. Now, a little known fact that I just learned I don't know if you guys are fans of uh, the Jalen and Jacoby show, but I listen to the Jalen and Jacoby show, and they do the, kind of like a wrap up show on this documentary every, uh, every Monday on each part. And, uh, they have the director of The Last Dance, Jason Ayer, on there. And Jason Ayer said that during the filming of the documentary, he had multiple sources um, tell them that 
Chuck Daly, if it was if it was any piston that Chuck Daly was going to bring on the team, it was going to be Dumas. it was going to be Joe Dumas because <laughs> because they needed a defensive presence on that team. So the director of the documentary said that Ch- Chuck Daly's pick was Joe Dumars, not Isaiah Thomas, because of his defensive presence. <laughs> and and right. because, one second, Ray, okay. because, because Chuck Daly didn't want to go back to the team that next year and have some kind of animosity that he picked Dumars over Isaiah, Chuck Daly kind of, that's why I think Chuck Daly didn't press for Isaiah as much as he did, or, or Joe Dumars. You know, he, that's, he just left it alone, and, and Isaiah was left off, and Joe Dumars. And I looked it up earlier today. That season, the season before the Dream Team, Dumars averaged uh, more points than Isaiah that season. Okay. Yeah. Um, whoever – I don't rem- I don't even remember the name that you said who said that. Jason Ayer, the director of The Last Dance. Okay, Jason Ayer, uh, whoever he is. Uh, I really um, – <laughs> you know, Chuck Daly obviously isn't alive to defend that whether he said that or not. So I think that's kind of Bush League that that guy would say something so stupid like that. And look, who doesn't respect Joe Dumars, first of all? And I'm not dis- – I don't mean any right. disrespect to Joe Dumars at all, right. okay? Um, but uh, – um, right. Say it. Okay, the guy said more defense. He yeah. said he really wanted to bring more defense. Why do you need defense when you're beating people by 75 points? <laughs> Well, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. Like I've always said, like I've always said, uh, Isaiah should have had the right to play, to be a part of these ass whoopings that they were unleashing. You don't need defense in the Olympics. This is the United States of America. We have the best players in the world by far. We're far superior. We don't need a defensive player. Yeah, you you got to remember. You know, just look good. I mean, you know, I'm telling Jason Ayer, whoever the hell he is, I don't even know if I'm – pronouncing his name right that, that's the single dumbest thing i've ever heard in my life that that someone would take joe dumars over isaiah thomas that's more ridiculous than when carl malone put scotty pippen in his all-time five and don't have michael jordan on it. that just that just eclipsed he just let carl malone off the hook that that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard joe dumars will tell you that too well, you have to remember that the years passed, the Olympics passed. That's why, that's why these NBA guys got brought on the team because USA was getting their ass kicked in, in international basketball. So, oh, Arvita Sabonis in 88 was shitting all over Rasheed Wallace and uh, <laughs> not Rasheed, David Robinson and uh, yeah. Lonzo Warning. Yep. So, this was the first, this was a first time experience um, having pro players on the, on the Olympic team. So, yeah, I mean, nobody could have predicted that these guys were going to blow people out by 70 points. <laughs> I'm, I'm just sorry. saying, no, nobody, nobody could have predicted that they were, that they were going to be blowing people out like that. So they're trying to build the team the right, you know, the, the best way possible. And one of the coaches says, "Hey, we need another defender on the team, or we need a defensive presence at guard." I don't think that's such a bad thing, and I don't think you could have gone wrong with either one of those guys. Yes, I think we're all in agreement that Isaiah Thomas should have been that guy. But if Chuck Daly backed out of the argument or didn't push for either one of those guys because he didn't want to have to choose between his two best players. You know, I I would believe that. If if you're gonna if, if you're gonna say uh, we should have had a little more defense on our team, Dennis Rodman averaged 18 rebounds a year, or I'm sorry, per game that year, 92. I mean, have him on the team. That, that, sure. That's uh, who's that? What's no, that I one reporter? That. Nick Wright is that? Is there Nick Wright that I, that weasel dick guy? Nick Wright is that his name? Yeah. I have more respect for that guy, Nick Wright, than than the guy you're just talking about. Well, I would have, you know, trust me, I would have taken Rodman over Christian Leitner any day. No, I'm talking about Joe Dumars, Dumars and Isaiah. That, no, come on, man. Come on. But we're forgetting something very important. Like, we've, we've missed a couple of good things. Number one, Pistons general manager at the time, Jack McCoskey, was on the selection committee and resigned. He didn't advocate for Isaiah either before he resigned. As a matter of fact, he point. said That's a good point. he said that Isaiah wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to him if he wasn't picked. That probably was a bad thing to say. And then we got to go back a little bit to Jordan's rookie year to that all-star game, that freeze out, where it's, it's believed that Isaiah led that freeze out of Jordan's rookie year when he only got nine shots in the all-star game. But the story that I, I've uh, read is that it was Magic, George Gervin, and Isaiah, but Isaiah was on Jordan's team. Magic and George Gervin were on the West. so. 
he didn't hold the grudge against them as badly. Um, but they were hard on Jordan, just like Jordan was hard on Kobe in Kobe's uh, first All Star game. And so we got to we Jordan is a uh, Jordan is real sensitive. You know, I'm and I'm not saying that in, in a negative way, but he 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 remind me of Kevin Durant reminds me of Michael Jordan in the sense mm-hmm. that. He reads the press clippings. He takes it to heart. Um, and uber competitive too. Super competitive, and that's and that, and that drives him. So he finds something to drive him, mm-hmm. whether it's small or big. He's gonna make it big because he's got to make it enough to drive him. But it says a lot about um, Isaiah. And then we got a. I'm not. I'm. I've never been a Stockton fan. I will say Isaiah didn't make the All NBA team. None of the All NBA teams since 1987. Uh, so he and Stockton did. So there is some case. Now that's politics involved in those teams. Don't get me wrong, but there is some case to say that Stockton was uh, more consistent at the time, talent-wise. No, and 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 then we remember Carl Malone gave Isaiah an elbow in the game so bad he bloodied him up with forty some stitches. Yeah. He had real beef with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, Malone's sticking up for his teammate. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. He's sticking up for his player. That's something yeah, I Yeah, I got no issue. I got no issue with the bow, I'm saying, but Isaiah had real beef with a lot of people on that team. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Isaiah was going to try to touch Carl Malone up in practice. You can believe it. If Isaiah would have been on that team, he was going to – he ain't going to forget that them 40-some stitches. He, gonna, he carrying that scar around to date. Yeah. So – but the crazy thing is I just thought of, fellas, that with the ones we're talking about and, it's, you know, the questions you don't think of when you meet people, but I've actually met Michael Jordan, Isaiah, Chuck Daly, and Magic Johnson. And wow. I ran into Chuck Daly and Isaiah Thomas in the airport on separate occasions, which was crazy. And, I mean, just very Man. cool people. Man, I was, was I was just, on, I was on a flight with Dennis Rodman. He didn't want to talk to nobody. <laughs> really? He didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> he didn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> he probably didn't want to talk to you. Let me, well, well, let me the freeze out. Can I say something about the freeze out game, the yes. All Star game, Mike's uh, rookie year? Um, obviously, we'll never know like the facts because we weren't in that locker room. If I personally, I uh, like. If uh, because people say Magic and Isaiah orchestrated that time, whatever, but Isaiah uh said that he said, Think about this. He said, In 1985, he said, That was my fourth year in the league. He said, In my Eastern Conference locker room was Moses Malone, Larry Bird, Dr. J, Bernard King. He said, I had, he said, I was low man on the totem pole. He said, I, I had no say on how the Eastern Conference All-Stars are going to play. He said, my mouth was shut and my ears were open. So that's how Isaiah claimed his uh, his innocence. But but like like uh, Marcellus said, though, you know, Mike's pretty sensitive. And, you know, people hear that and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't see how Isaiah could have done that. But. Isaiah is the guy that will shake your hand, smile, and tell, tells you that he loves you, and then will put that knife in your back when you turn around. I, I love that about him. I love it. Now, Thanks. I want to I, I pose this situation to each one of you and get your, get your answer on this. So, Marcellus made, a, made an interesting, interesting comment about uh, Jack McCoskey being on the, uh, the selection committee, right, and not really pushing for Isaiah. What are you going to do? as either a member, like a coach or a member of the selection committee, when you have a guy that you want on, on the team and you have not only one, but probably three of the biggest basketball superstars of all time in Magic, Jordan, and Bird, and all three of them come to you and say, we're not playing if this guy plays. What, what are you going to do? Are you going to press the issue? Or are you going to be like, okay, I guess he's not playing? What? You know, what do you do in that scenario when Michael Jordan, inevitably the best player in the world, the planet, at the height of his superstardom, says, I'm not playing if this guy plays, you know, kind of puts you in a precarious position. What are you going to do? Quit. Just like McClowski did. You're going to quit. Because <laughs> you have to save your team, even though you know Isaiah's at the end of his career. But it's no way, you know, 
obviously Bird and Magic were the two biggest icons of basketball at that time that actually yeah. saved the game and, you know, took the game to another level before Michael, you know, got into his. It was no way he was the Ma- Michael was the best player, and Magic and Bird saved your game. <clears throat> you were not, no matter what. So McClowski can say, you know, no, he wasn't fighting for Isaiah, whatever. But his best move he did was like, okay, I'm leaving it because he Isaiah loved him, of course. So he he left. He could say his story could be whatever he wanted to be at that point, but there's no way he could go into that room and say, all right, man, we y'all need to figure it out. Y'all got to accept Isaiah. Right. Because it would have yeah, been. With that. Go ahead, Marcellus. No, I'm with that, man. I you you had to give in at that point because the USA needed the dream team at that time to reestablish control in the basketball game worldwide. Um, and the amount of press that that dream team got basketball globally took the NBA to another level. Yeah. You know where Magic and Bird saved it. And, and, and carried it because, you know, if we remember the finals were on tape delay when Magic and Bird got in the league. So yeah. they took it to one level and that global sensation of the dream team took it off the chart. Now, Larry Bird was well past his prime. His back took him, you know, at that time had taken him out. Uh, you know, Chris Mullen, you know, some of these guys were, you know, they were great players, but could there have been different players on a team? Sure. Because Shaq had been there instead of Leitner, but the tradition was to take the the college best player, right. and that and that was Leitner at the time. Now, we could argue that all day, but I think if you're in that USA headquarters, you saying, "Look, Mike said he ain't playing if Isaiah comes." Yeah, sorry, Isaiah. Yeah, <laughs> there's no way in hell uh, Jordan was was not going to be on that team. It, the USA basketball and the NBA couldn't afford for Jordan not to be on that team. No, no way. And it, you know, interesting fact before I let Ray answer, you know, I was curious about that today. I was like, man, Chris Mullen, like, were there any better options on that team than Chris Mullen? And I looked it up and I think he was actually like second or third in scoring that year behind, behind Jordan. And I was like, okay, damn, I guess there wasn't a better option. How many points the Golden State Warriors were putting up back then? They were putting yeah, up a run, lot. run TMC, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you know, when, when Dan, when you say, you know, um, you know, who are you going to pick between Jordan and Isaiah? I mean, yeah, of course you're going to pick Michael. But, um, you know, let's not, um, let's not forget, you know, that, uh, you know what, I don't want to get into that stuff. I'm going to say this. I'm going to answer <laughs> this. I can't, okay, coming from a fan's point of view, okay, if not, I'm not Jack McCluskey, but from a fan's point of view, if, if the uh, if the reason that you're not having Isaiah on the team is because he wouldn't be a good teammate and can cause chemistry issues, then I'm okay with that. But what I've been hearing a lot of is is that is because he didn't shake their hands, that ultimately blew his, his opportunity. If that's if that's your reason, I don't agree with that. Yeah. But um, yeah, but, I'm with you, right? Uh, yeah, I yeah, definitely it believe that. Like, it looks like uh, you know if if it's going to be a Michael versus Isaiah thing. Then I mean, yeah, you're gonna take Michael Jordan, but I don't know. If I was in Jack McCluskey's position, I, I really don't know what I. I'm a loyal person. Uh, I would have. Um, I, yeah, but see, but when Jack McCluskey, uh, when when he was uh, at the end of his tenure, being our our general manager, that that ended really. That was a bad breakup. The way our team broke up. Um, you know, that ultimately, that ultimately ended up, you know, Rodman almost killing himself in the parking lot, like literally. Uh, Bill Lambeer quit, you know, uh, in 94, like a month into the season. Um, he said things in the paper about McCluskey. I, so I don't know, man. I don't know what Jack McCluskey was thinking about. But um, so if, if you're not going to have Isaiah on the team because he didn't shake hands, then, you know, shame on you. But if, it, if, if the team got together and said he's going to cause chemistry issues, then that would be a good reason to, I guess, not have him on the team. I well, guess. I don't, I don't think you could point to the 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 walk off as the the reason. I think the walk off was the cherry on the top. You know what I mean? I think if I think if the Pistons shake the Bulls' hands in in '91, I don't think we're talking about this. You know what I mean? Because I think I think Jordan and Isaiah could have kissed and made up. You know, if 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 the Bulls don't get disrespected like that and and the Pistons don't walk off. 
it, it might have been a different story. You know what, what I mean? For walking off. What was their reason for walking off? Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit later when we talk talk about the rivalry stuff. Because again, once again, I think it's a product of your uh, your own making. You know, and, and you know the. This happened to the, the, the Pistons. Celtics did to the Pistons. Pistons felt they had to do it to the Bulls. So I, I think that that was just a cherry on top. And, and you could have, could Isaiah have, have come on the team and, you know, apologize to Magic, apologize to Jordan and, and made up and try to, you know, make friends again? Yes. But is the Olympics the right place to do that? Is Team USA the right scenario and the right setting to do that? I don't think so. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I hear you, man. I, I just think, I think ultimately Isaiah burned a lot of bridges. I think a lot of guys were, were very uh, sensitive to that. I mean, the root, the story is Isaiah tried to apologize to Jordan uh, after that, that all-star game and Jordan wasn't having it and dropped 49 on him that next game. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things I just think, I just think Jordan created grudges in some ways to uh, fuel him like a lot of superstars do. A lot of guys create, you know, anything. And and uh, Isaiah just got caught up in a windstorm that just would never end, you know. Yeah. To this day, it's still, I mean, he's more famous right now because of that documentary and everybody talking about it again. Yeah. He's been years. Yep. Yep. For once, they're talking about uh, the bad boys and the, and the walk-off and the rivalry and the dream team, and they're not talking about how terrible the GM he was. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you know, shaking the hands thing. Okay, George and Marcellus, you guys are basketball players. Have you you shaken hands every single game that you've ever played in your entire life? Are you telling me you've shaken hands 100 percent of the time? This is not a hockey uh, where, you're, where you're supposed to shake hands. That that's um that narrative uh that always bothers me because they didn't shake. Michael's hand and I you know I guess what I was getting ready to get into we're going to talk about it later but um we didn't you know Michael Mike shook our hands you know after we beat them you know three years in a row very easily <laughs> um, but um something happened before game four but Dan wants to talk about that later so I won't get into that now we're gonna get to that real quick yeah but I, I think I don't know if Marcellus and George you would agree to me unless a team does something to you uh that crosses the line. You know, if you got a team that's dirty and comes out and like picking fights or like, and now I'm not talking about bad boy style leader. I'm talking about really over the line. Like you, you shake hands, right? No matter how much you don't like them, right? You, after the end of the game, you shake hands. You, you know what I mean? That's it's just a well, sign of a good game kind of thing, you know? Well, let me say this. Let me say this because I'm a basketball coach and people might find this interesting. I don't necessarily agree with post game handshakes. I think if you shake hands, you do it before the game because it's too many emotions, too many raw emotions in sports for right after the game to – it's so much stuff that happens in those post-game handshake lines. Not so much on a professional level, but I coach AAU basketball. I mean, it's it's been times where the other coach and I have been at odds. And so that, that post-game handshake line is a whole another ball game. To me, you get that out the way before the game. And and that's the way it would it would uh, ease that tension of those emotions. But I'm not a big post game handshake guy. I don't think um, it's a real huge deal. I'm with you, Dan, in the sense that if you're out there playing dirty, I'm definitely not shaking your hand. Like that's not gonna happen. Uh, and I think the bad boys was past that line. Now they were getting away with it in the early or in the late '80s because that was the way the NBA was played. Um, so the rules hadn't changed yet. So I'm not mad at them for playing that way. They did what they had to do to win. But I can understand why somebody would have a grudge. But in that post-game handshake line, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I, I'm not a, a huge proponent of it. Okay. Go ahead, Jordan. I'm with hey, Jordan. Central versus Northern. That's all I got to say. <laughs> 94. I mean, it wasn't no – Antonio and Robert wasn't coming to shake my hand right. at the end of that game. It was that, not I, about handshaking. Yeah, um, I think that's a good example of what Marcellus was just saying. Yeah. You know, they they were wrapped up in the emotion of of losing at the last minute and getting giving up that game. Uh, but I think that's not more on them. You know what I mean? That's a personal yeah. mistake by them and not saying, okay, they beat us. Let's shake their hands and, and no, go. They were they were on a whole nother level. And I've 
and I've hugged both of them since then. It was never a thing of, you know, between us personally. We played on the same teams and things of that nature and, you know, really just sat down, talked. I mean, I flew with Antonio, you know, airplane. But the thing is, height, when you're that high, you know, high of a level athletically and competition-wise, and you know, as said it key, you're doing a lot during that game to compete. Mentally, it's a whole different level. So many people that don't compete just think it's, oh, your workout, oh, it's, you know, you just, you have talent and you work out and that's it. No, the competition is so much mentally to the game. I mean, even to this day, like I still, in a pickup game, I still use mental games that I use all my life to distract players because it's still to get to the goal of winning. Of course, it's not as competitive and to that level, but shaking hands, I think that for sports as a whole would be the best thing. Like say, go, you know, shake hands, say, hey, you know, for the game. Now when that ball goes up, you know, it's a, it's a different level. Magic love Isaiah, but, you know, he told Isaiah when he came to the hole. Oh, yeah, that's, I, th- I think Jordan was a, the perfect example of that, too, because Jordan was friends with a lot of guys on a lot of different teams and, and even hung out with them the night before games, the night before big playoff games. But then as soon as, they, as soon as that ball tips off, you're just in my way between, you're between me and that basket. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's how you think about it like this, too. Like people like Isaiah, maybe some guys that were shorter, maybe they came from tougher upbringings, and they had to fight and claw for everything that they got on the basketball court. I was one of the, I was a late bloomer playing basketball. So I probably didn't, I didn't peak until I was in my twenties, my early twenties. And I took it out in the rec ball, on everybody that doubted me. And I hated you. Like I literally made myself hate you before the game. So that during the game, I was never going to be nice to you. Like it was no, it was nothing there about you that I liked. I mean, I remember playing against my brother and, and us having some some battles uh, that we probably, you know, as brothers, it was like, I mean, this is this is my best friend. But when we was on the court, I was going at him, and I'm seven inches shorter than he is. But and blocking my shot. But go ahead. It didn't matter. It didn't, I remember I asked him one game. Y'all find this funny? One time we were playing, and he elbowed me in the face, and uh, he caught me right here in the jaw, and and I couldn't even open my mouth all the way. And he didn't do it on purpose. He I was behind him and he was dribbling and his arm flew back and hit me. And I asked him, I said, dang, are you my brother? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, and, and it was one of them things that kind of shocked me. And he never really wanted to play against me again because that, that raw emotion of basketball, was it was even there between brothers, um, legit blood brothers. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real deal. And that's why I think, coming off those raw emotions is so that see hockey is different because you expect to fight in hockey. Like you have guys designated to fight, you know what I'm saying? So they, that's a part of the game. You take your penalty, you go somewhere. Basketball, that fighting and clawing is, is, it's a part of the game, but it ain't supposed to be. So, right. so those things still drum up raw emotion. And, and that's why I'm like, Hey, just do this handshake before the game. We had talked to each other later on after we calmed down, but but right after the game, that's just a it's a rough time. I mean, we've seen high school this past year uh, with the number one player in the nation, and Monty Bates. Uh, they came after him after the game, you know, the other team. So, you know, it's it's still there. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's transition to something. Uh, talk about raw emotion and. Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I speak on that? Because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because you, you've done that a few times today. Where did you guys ever see that TNT episode where Kenny Smith, Barkley, and Shaq? Where it's one minute, one minute, one minute. Remember Shaq wanted to whoop Chuck's ass because Chuck spoke, <laughs> Kenny spoke, and then right before Shaq talked, Barkley just cut him off. Did you you guys remember that episode? <laughs> yep. Dan, that's what you're doing. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. My, my apologies. You go right to you. And you weren't even going to let me say what I was going to say about the handshake. You got to go back to the handshake. Okay. Um, what I, uh, you guys remember when Michael Jordan didn't shake Alonzo Mourning's hand before the game against the Miami Heat? Remember, mm. remember the famous Alonzo Mourning thing where he just left him hanging? Do you guys remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I know. You, you don't remember that, Dan? I Both guess I don't. I guess I don't. No. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that, that did happen. 
Of course you don't know about it because it was Michael that did it. Because, <laughs> uh, but no, like, if I'm in the Pistons uh, situation, like game four of the Eastern Conference Finals, when a day before Michael Jordan uh, said that uh, he, he called them thugs, said they were bad, said they were bad people, basically attacking their character. When um, when Michael don't even you know know any of these guys personally, called Bill Lambeer a thug. Bill Lambeer is like, even the way he acted, the way he acted on the court. A lot of people don't know, man. That guy's like a billionaire's son. I was a billionaire. Um, I wouldn't have shook their hands either. Would you guys shake hands if somebody attacked your character and saying you were a bad person and like getting real personal? I'm not going to shake hands. And I'm a handshaker at the end of the game. I'm not one of those hugging type guys, hugging and kissing like they do now. But I'm a, you know, fist bump when it's over, it's over. But if you're going to attack my character right before you're getting ready to put us out, talk about us as people and get personal with us, had nothing to do with basketball, I'm not going to shake your hands either. And like I've told Dan several times, I said when the Pistons walked off the court, I walked off with them. And I still feel that way right now. So, so I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't disagree at all with them walking off the court. Hey, but Ray, I'm just me. You know, with that component being there, if I'm Isaiah and them, I'm not walking by them and not giving them a look or something. Uh, my head ain't going to be just going by. They were more civil than I would have been. I'm going to look at you like, you know, you had a whole lot to say, you know, the night before. Yeah. yeah. You know, a basketball outside of it, down this game is over. You know, more of that meet me in the parking lot type of thing, you know. I can get that with that component, but I'm just not, it's going to be very hard for me to just walk by you and not even look at you. I told Dan something similar the other day, what you just said, George. Remember, Dan, I told you, you know, when you watch that documentary, you know, Dan, you found it pretty amusing when Horace Grant called us a bunch of bitches and all that or whatever. Said that on that documentary. Yep. He didn't like, like George said, how come he didn't say that on, you know, on the court, call us bitches on the court. When we walked by you, Horace Grant was just as silent with his head down as everybody else was. Why are you call us a bitch then? I, I said the same thing, George. Same thing you just said, basically. Yep. It just in another way. Right. Yeah, it, it wasn't right. And I, and I wouldn't say I was amused by it. I was shocked by what he said. But you got 20 years or 20 plus years to 30 plus years, whatever oh, it is. Make to, a stand, to think you stand about. by it. Right. No, you make a stand, you stand by it. No, don't. No. I, uh, let me ask Marcellus and George a question here. If, if you're in Dennis Rodman's shoes right now, and you hear all the, like, like Horace Grant calling the bad boys bitches. I thought they were a bunch of bitches. And, and you hear people like attacking the bad boys, like social media type shit. I wonder what Rodman's like real opinion is on all that. I wonder if he ever like sticks up for those guys when they're getting attacked like that, being called names and expletives and all that. What do you, how would you feel if you were in Rodman's position? <laughs> well, I think Rodman is going to be coming out with the next show or whatever else because he – He's actually the most interesting figure in it all. If you think about it, you win your two championships with the Pistons and you go and, you know, and help this little guy, Michael, that you've been beating up to win his last three and be an integral component. You know, people talk about John Sally and, and Buddha. Okay, yeah, but Dennis Rodman was a very integral component of he had to be there. He played, he did the role Horace Grant better than Horace Grant ever did it. Um, oh, yeah. you know, to that team. So I'm sure he's hearing this and, you know, I'm sure some cuts of something, you know, he's heard and said that they may not have put in these documentaries, but Dennis knows how soft Horace Grant is and was. <laughs> you know, Dennis knows personally because, you, you know, you think about it, how many times did Jordan and them have to tell Horace Grant to quit whining? And they said that. Like, yeah. we had to tell him to quit whining. Yeah, I heard him. Yep, he said that on the doctor. Because he always wanted to come and fight or whatever, and they were beating him up until he figured it out, you know, how to play and play differently. So Dennis, I'm sure, has plenty to say on this subject. What do you think, Marcellus? Yeah, I think Robin, I think part of him don't care anymore about it, <laughs> honest with you, just because just as his character. Um, but I think Robin is, uh, like George said, I think he's, he's probably the most interesting guy. And I think he's the guy, and we, we're probably going to get into this later when we talk about the rivalry yeah. uh, more, more in, intently. But, but I, I think uh, the fact that he ended up and they handpicked him 
to to uh, to to help Jordan get those last three is is very uh is very interesting. And I I wonder what Robin would say about Mike when he was a Piston and Robin was checking him up. You know, pretty much doing a great job defensively against him. I wonder what Robin was saying about him. Was he because you know at the time Jordan didn't lift weights. You know, what I'm saying there was a lot of things he didn't do at that time, and they were pushing him around. You know, pretty good there. So I, I think Robin would have if if somebody would really get Robin to be real about everybody, he would he would probably shock us all with what he said. Well, he, what he would have to say about those bulls. Yeah, um, Dan. Before you get into your next question, there's there's one guy uh, that I want to give a, a plug to, and it's Charles Oakley. Okay. Even though he wasn't really a part of the Detroit-Chicago rivalry, he was in 88. But the next year is when they traded him for Bill Cartwright. Now, I'm an Oakley fan. Uh, this is like the only – I don't know if this is like a positive thing I'll say about Chicago, but this is like the, probably the only non-negative thing I'll say about Chicago. <laughs> I, I kind of wish – because as far as the center position goes, Michael Jordan proved to you that he can win with any center. When you got guys like Luke Longley – Bill Wennington and a 55-year-old Robert Parrish play at center and you're still winning and dominating, you can win with any, any center. I wish that that Cartwright and Oakley trade would have never went down, and I kind of wish that Oakley could have played with Michael the whole way through because I, I like Oakley. What do you think about Oak? They still would have won all those championships with Oak? No. They needed the, they needed the size. It wasn't, it wasn't the skill set per se. It was the size. They needed the height. Um, they had to have somebody that was down there closing down the lane um, with some height because you had guys um, the, the remember the NBA was big man dominated back then, yeah. you know, before it was a lot of good, real good big men and great big men. So you needed that tall guy that could play defense. That's what they got Luke Longley and Bill Cartwright and those guys for. They could care less if they scored five points or 25 points, just play some B in that lane. And Oakley was getting abused by the, the taller centers, and that's not his fault. He just wasn't that tall, you know. Okay. George? Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Marcellus on that, I think it was – and, you know, and Jordan even knew it, I think, at that time. Because they were – obviously, Oakley was his enforcer. He didn't, he didn't really agree with it in the beginning because – Part of it was, you know, Jordan got to shoot the ball all the time. Oakley never needed it. And, you know, if anybody best with him, Oakley coming in. So when that whole transformation of how they were playing came in and they knew what they needed to do to get, you know, to the championship point, those those centers were there. They kept three of them, you know, just to run out there. They had, you know, you have 18 fouls there. When you playing against the, you know, Patrick Ewing out in the east and stuff and they're playing with the – the Davis boys and all of those that are active and, you know, going to the boards and can score. I mean, it was big men, like I said, big men dominant that could score. And that's, you know, another thing we talk about the Jordan era. Jordan was just different. He was different for the fact he was athletic and, a, you know, a two guard that was that athletic when it wasn't that type of league. So without, with Oakley, they would have, I'm sure they would have added somebody to win. You know, I would never say that Jordan, you know, Oakley was it would have stayed. Jordan would never would have got a championship, no. But would they have been through the, the three-peat like that? Nah. Twice? No. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So let, let's uh, let's extend the, the handshake kind of conversation here a little bit before we're, we're going to get more into the, the Pistons-Bulls rivalry stuff. And, and to me, that era of basketball, that, that was my favorite era of basketball. Like, I loved – the Pistons, I love the Bulls. I love watching them play. Um, you know the the Bulls Knicks series. You know the Pistons, uh, that tough, hard nosed type of basketball. Like that was my favorite era of basketball. And and I think between the, the Pistons, the Bulls, and Bulls Knicks, you know those those games are some of my most favorite to watch. You know the physical games, the the the, the dominant performances by those players on those teams. Um, what what are some of your fondest memories before we get into that? Let's the the handshake thing, right? So like I I was on the phone a couple uh, a couple weeks ago with Ray when that first came out, and I was talking to him, and I was I'm going to reiterate this. I know I said this at the beginning, but you know, the bad boys were a product of their own making. You know, like they they 
they made they laid their bed or they made their bed and then they got a lie in it. You know, they they chose to be the bad boys and there was repercussions from that. There was consequences from that, you know. Um, with the rivalries they established. Now the handshake thing, I told Ray this. Um I, I don't I know, I guess I didn't just disagree. And I know the comments, um it, it, Ray wants to talk about the comments. I know those that played into it, but Isaiah specifically said in that documentary, he's like, you know, that's what the Celtics did to us. When we, when we beat the Celtics, you know, they walked off on us. So we're going to walk off on the Bulls. That's kind of how Isaiah saw it. That's how you pass the torch, right? You beat us, we're going to walk off the court. Now, I know that Jordan's comments before that game didn't help the situation and probably propelled that, that, that walk off even further. But I don't know. What do you guys think about that? You know, if, if was it right to say, you know, well, if the, is it, and is, is this more the Celtics' fault? If the Celtics don't walk off on the Pistons, do you think the Pistons walk off on the on the Bulls? George, what do you think? Well, I don't, I don't know if it was. I could totally, you know, blame the Celtics for it. Yes, they did it. They went through their battles, and you know, there was the Celtics were. People give them so much credit, and, you know, sometimes I'm even surprised by it. Like, the Celtics in the 80s, they never even won back-to-back championships. I mean, the, the, the 80s were the Lakers, really. I mean, the Lakers really dominated the 80s. And then, for you know, the Celtics beat up on, obviously, the Pistons in the East. But at the time when the Pistons took over, yes, Larry and them walked off. Um, Mikhail you know, got some words in with Isaiah there at the end. But I can't blame. It's just like another man has this action, and this is how they did us. I see how you treat me, but I'm going to treat you like they did us after you, you know, I'm good with you. I'll shake your hand everything when it's going well. But when, you know, it doesn't go my way, then I'm not going to shake your hand. Now, like you said, Ray said earlier, it was more to that you know, outside things said, and it was, it's just all been made to look like it was just Isaiah and the Pistons mad they got swept, which, yeah, they weren't happy about that component. They seen that it was over and all of that, but to say that, you know, that's the way they make it look, but it, it gets more to it, and, you know, the outside stuff added in, it just, the appearance is always going to be bad if anybody sees that nowadays, even in the college game or whatever, the appearance of it is going to be bad. Marcel? Yeah, you know, it's the, the old adage is two wrongs don't make a right. And so if you thought that was wrong, then you shouldn't do it if you thought it was wrong. Now, if you thought it was just part of passing the torch and that's how old heads did it, then maybe you did. I don't know that Isaiah really believed that, though. I think he was kind of mad that they walked off on them. And so that's why Lambeer led the charge, like, hey, let's walk off on them. We don't like them anyway. And and I think the comments did play into it. Uh, we don't really care about them. So, hey, they got the dub. They beat us. Let's, let's, let's bounce, though. But, but you know, I, I don't think uh, the Celtics – I mean, the Celtics – I think the Celtics walking off on the Pistons had a racial component mixed in that people took. And so I think that's what made it a little bit uh, tough to swallow for a lot of people because I just think they were looked at. The Celtics has always been looked at as that red Arbach, you know, Celtics, you know what I'm saying, that uh, they were the fundamental uh, white guys playing ball. And Detroit was led, you know, by this inner city Chicago kid, you know what I'm saying? So, but there really wasn't that component with the Bulls and the, the, the Pistons. I just think, you know, it was that that rivalry, that hate, and I don't really. I think Isaiah kind of uses that as a, a little bit of an excuse as to why they did it. I would rather him just say, "Man, we didn't like him." You know what I'm saying? And that that is what it is, and just own it. Right. Well, um, Dan, I got to correct you on one thing. Uh, it, it wasn't us, the uh, bad boys, that. Uh, you had mentioned that we, you know, we called ourselves the bad boys. It was actually, uh, God rest his soul, David Stern was the first one that labeled us the bad boys because he went on record to saying that, like, uh, 
way after the bad boys uh, era. He said that he regrets ever calling them that and all that. And uh, I don't agree with that because David Stern generated a lot of money uh, with that bad boy thing. Yeah. Um, the, hand, the, the handshake thing, uh, Isaiah um, Isaiah's went on record, you know, quite a few times saying that that if they had to do it over again, that he would shake their hands. Um, now, the thing with Lambeer, because it was actually his – he's the one, like Marcellus said, Lambeer's the one – that on the bench that orchestrated that walkout it wasn't Isaiah. It was Lambeer's the one that basically told them guys, "We're what we're we're not shaking our hands. We're walking out." Oh yeah, they showed it right on the documentary. Lambeer came over and Isaiah described it. Lambeer came over and you know whispered in his ear, "Let's walk um, off on these guys." Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I I usually agree with like everything Lambeer has ever said or anything. <laughs> um, and I'm not, and I I still would have walked off. I still feel very strongly about my opinions on that walk off, but I think uh, where Lambeer kind of made a mistake, in my opinion, is you got to realize like when Lambeer came to our team in the early '80s, he basically like for that whole deck, the rest of the decade of the '80s, and then like the early '90s, he took on the role that you know what I'm gonna take the heat for all these guys. I'm going to get the entire NBA to hate me. I'm going to be the most hated guy in the world. He always took the heat like a wrestler. Now, with the handshake thing, I, th I think that um, I think that Lambeer brought a lot of heat to the entire team, and I don't think that was fair to Isaiah or the rest of the guys. So I, I, uh, I don't know if I want to say that I fault Lambeer for coming up with that concept. I'm not saying I disagree with him. I just I kind of feel Lambeer brought a lot of heat on our team, so that that's what I regret about that. Lambeer should have uh, thought about that. I was going to heat on these guys for the rest of their lives. But do you think um, do you think if Jordan doesn't make those comments the day before, do you think Lambeer even gets that idea in his head? Um, I think uh, no one like obviously I don't know these guys personally, but right. like no one like the bad boys like I do. I, I think. I think they would have shook their hands. I think Lambeer would have been the only guy that would have probably walked off. Lambeer would have been the only guy that wouldn't have shook their hands. Everybody, they, I think they would have told them good luck. You know, there wouldn't have been hugging and kissing and exchanging jerseys and all that dumb shit they do now. But um, Lambeer would have still walked. Lambeer would have walked off no matter what. He hates the Chicago Bulls. He has no respect for them. Uh, he respects Magic and Bird, those Boston LA teams. He doesn't have any respect for Scottie Pippen and Horace. Grant Paxson and Dave Corzine and um, Charles Davis, uh, you know, Cartwright, Will Purdue. He doesn't respect any of those guys. Lambeer is definitely walking off. But I think, like, the big the big guns of the team, your Isaiah Thomases, your Joe Dumars, you know, John Sally, uh, being a people person that he is, he would have congratulated. I don't know about Rodman. You never know what he's going to do. He probably would have. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> that's what I think would have happened. Yeah, you never know. Maybe, uh, you know, if Jordan doesn't make those comments, Maybe if Lambeer come, comes over in that same situation and says, hey, let's walk off on these guys, maybe Isaiah, you know, says, you know, puts a hand on his back and says, no, man, let, let's, let's just squash it. Let's shake their hand and just leave in, in, you know, in a dignified way. But you never know. That's a what if. Never know. So, so what's, uh, what's some of your guys' fondest memories of this, of the Bulls-Pistons games back in the, you know, 80s, 90, round in that corner? Marcellus, what 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 are some of the games or moments you remember the most? I don't, you know, me being a big Scottie Pippen fan, I, I'll just say, you know, I know that's gonna get under Ray's skin, but my my biggest thing was I remember them just just beating the the snot out of Scotty and uh him not being able to mentally take it initially. And uh, you know, we he had to grow into that and Mike helped him a lot in that mental side of it. He just couldn't take that beating that he was getting. And, uh, finally he overcame that. And that they showed that on that documentary where, where Robin pushed him and he didn't respond. He just sat there and then he got up, he had that look and got up and just got up and knocked down his free throws and went about life. And, uh, you know, <laughs> y'all find this funny, but, uh, I was big. Somebody had told me back then that 
about subliminal messages. That was the first time I had learned about subliminal messages. And they were saying that if you said something to somebody while they were asleep, that they could, their subconscious would hear you. So I used to sneak in, in while George was asleep and I would tell him to play like Scotty Pippen and Larry Bird. Those are the, those were two names. That's cool. Those were the two wow. names that, um, that I used to say. Now he got the Larry Bird part. He got the, he got the Larry Bird part down with the jump shot. The Pippen part, he didn't quite get the defensive part down all the way. Oh, uh, but, uh, yeah. I really used to try to push that on him because, you know, I knew my brother could play. And I just really, I was that high on Scottie Pippen. And, uh, you know, I think um, it would be those, the fun, the memories, though, is it was about teams back then a lot more, right? So people had teams, like Ray's a diehard Pistons guy. Didn't matter, you know, who was on the team. I'm diehard Pistons. Uh, you know, people love the Knicks because they were the Knicks. People love the Pacers because they were the Pacers, you know. It's a different day now. Even myself, I'm more of an individual basketball player guy. I'm not a team guy per se. Um, I can remember having a Charles Barkley shirt on back then, you know, because I, you know, I, I thought Charles Barkley was 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 cool, you know. But uh, those days, man, is when you loved. It was right after they were punching people on the court, but they were still playing tough. You know what I'm saying? Like it was. You know, I don't want to go back to the 70s where Kermit Washington was knocking out Rudy T and crushing his face. That's not basketball. But that era in between or right after that where it was still hard nose in the paint, but it was, you know, you could still score on the outside. That That's what I appreciate the most about that era. Okay. George? Wow. First of all, Man, I don't think I, he ever told me about those subliminal messages he was sending, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in my sleep. So, you know, I'm learning this stuff 30 years later, you know. Well, thank, but, thank me for your jump shot, then. I'm just saying. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it because that joke is good. He said you couldn't play defense. He didn't have no problem blocking my shot all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it, it wasn't to his level. That's what it was, Ray. He, he was a defender that I bragged on all the time. I told people about different people he defended, you know, at his size from 6'11", cats that played at Michigan. I will not name them. We're not going to put folks out there like that, but to be 6'11". <laughs> Leon Derrick. <clears throat> uh, see, I didn't say it, but to be shut down, you know, by a six-footer, and it was just crazy. But those 80s, 90s, when, when he says team, that part of it really sticks out to me because – People forget Michael Jordan didn't know how to play with a team. Michael Jordan came in and he was about, you know, Michael Jordan. He thought Dean Smith even, you know, held him back from being what he could be because he's like, I can shoot more and I can make more. Not the fact that we won. He's like, I'm glad we won, but I could have scored more points type of thing. So, you know, that early part of it, so many of us. I mean, I had a bull starter jacket too. Don't get me wrong. And, you know, that component of, Michael Jordan, he's flashy. And like I said, he was different. But he didn't get the team concept that the Pistons actually had to tell him and show him because he – and not only them, the Lakers had to show him, the Celtics. It's like everybody – it was no one person on those teams that you looked at. It's like they're dominating the game and they're winning. When you can go and give the Celtics 63 and still lose, I mean, you got to figure it out. So those type of things – stuck out to me like and I didn't know that Isaiah hadn't made you know all NBA team since 87 and you know they won two championships after that and I know what he's done and what every player has done but to him Isaiah could have chased the, accol the accolades and accolades and however I'll say it correctly um, for personal gain but he sacrificed the stuff because he's like at the end of the day we gonna do whatever it takes to win we're tired of getting beat by the Celtics. And, you know, we got to fight them, run them over, whatever. We're going to do what it takes to get the people in place to do it. So I remember, you know, that and the team component and going into the 90s, like I said, it was still team basketball that was being so, you know, prevalent to more of the now. Like, I mean, I still watch it now. But nowadays, like Marcella said, I'm, I'm a player. I'm after player guys, you know, and I've 
been like that way started back then, honestly, in the 90s when, you know, I went to a Barkley guy. I was a Barkley guy. So when he went to Phoenix, I loved Phoenix, you know, and then I was a Weber guy. So when he was in Sacramento, after, you know, after the Warrior yep. days and Wizards, when he was in Sacramento, I was all about Sacramento. I had my heart hurt so many times, <laughs> you know, being that span. But it was still – the game was played so much differently that, you know, even though I feel that it's more talented players now, I don't think there's any question that's more talent. Anything that continues to go on, if it's not getting better, if, you know, technology and everything else and how they train and all that is not getting better or as decades go, it's like, what are we doing? Even though they're going back to the short shorts, but that's all I'll say. <laughs> all right, Ray. Bulls Pistons. Besides the handshake, what what are some of your fondest memories of those games between the Bulls and the Pistons? Um. Well, before I get into that, the um, the Isaiah Thomas thing about you know the All NBA team, about how he wasn't first team after 1985. I think after '85. You know, when Magic and Michael were in their prime, nobody in the history of the NBA is going to make the All-NBA team other than those two. So I don't mind Isaiah taking a back seat to the All-NBA first team, uh, Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. Nobody's making the All-NBA team other than them two. Now, um, me me personally, um, as far as the, the Detroit-Chicago rivalry goes and, like, memories that I have, uh, I'm going to do my best to not talk for an hour here because I got a lot of good memories and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to bad talk Chicago and anything that I say here. Um, you know, in 88, uh, you know, the last year we played at the Silver Dome, you know, we, the, uh, Chicago stole game two from us at the Dome. But other than that, you know, we beat them relatively easy. So that, that year in 88 was a relatively easy series. Um, the rivalry had started, uh, in January when Rick Mahorn beat the hell out of the whole organization. When he threw Doug Collins in press row, he took a swipe at Phil Jackson and Tex Winter. Uh, he, you know, was pushing and fighting and everybody. Uh, he threw Rory Sparrow to the ground. That's when the rivalry started in January 88. And then, like I said, in 88 in the playoffs, we beat them rather easily. Now, going to like 89, even though, even though in the regular season, we beat them six to zero, six games, nothing in the regular season. When the playoffs came, um, you know, we were the best team in the league that year, but, you know, Michael had established himself as, you know, the new best player in the world because Larry Bird was no longer the best individual player in the world. That Michael Jordan's title now. And I had some sleepless nights uh, during that series in 89. We beat them four games to two, but they had a 2-1 series lead on us because they won, they, they stole game one. We won game two, and then remember game three at Chicago, the Chicago Stadium, that loud stadium. Uh, Michael hit that baseline, you know, uh, jumper off on Rodman and Isaiah. They, they were up two games to one. So my hands are sweaty. I'm nervous. Uh, um, that's what makes the rivalry great. And, and what I liked about it is that we really hated these guys, and they hated us like, in, like a real hatred. Um, and then in 1990 – um, we beat them again, but you know, we were, um, that was a, that was a series where the home team won every playoff game. Um, I still, I, I still believe, and I'm not, no knock on Scotty Pippen. I still think we would have won game seven, even if Pippen would have played healthy the entire game. Um, because that game right there game my, okay. If I have to say, if I have to pick one memory, what was my fondest memory? I would say game seven in 1990. Because everybody knows that anything can happen in a game seven. I don't care who's hurt. I don't care who's hot. I don't care what the hell's going on. Anything can happen in a game seven. And that game seven was played on a Sunday, okay? So when I went to bed Saturday night, I lost a lot of sleep. Um, we, uh, in the second half, the way that we, I still rem remembered how, I mean, Mark Aguirre played great that game. Um, the whole, you know, from our three guard rotation to James Edwards and the fadeaway, you know, Rodman with all his shenanigans, getting the crowd pumped up. The Sally oop, you know, when when Isaiah threw the alley uh, to John Sally, he uh, backwards dunked it, whatever. Man, that was my fondest memory of that rival was winning that game seven, beating them a third year in a row, and 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 I was smart enough back then 
uh, me and my dad kind of, you know, talked about it. We kind of felt like this is probably the last time we'll beat them. Uh, we played them the next year in 91. This time Chicago has the home court advantage. Michael now knows how to involve, Michael now knows how to score 36 points and he knows how to involve everybody. And Pippen has emerged, you know. Um, after those first two games in Chicago, the way they kicked our ass, <laughs> even though we were going back home, we didn't, uh, I didn't feel like there was, that was going to be a competitive series. And this was before the comments, Michael Jordan's comments, but um, it, they were hungry. It was their year. It was their time. After game two, uh, you know, I'll tip my hat to them, you know, good luck, go get them. But, um, yeah, so I'd say my fondest memory was game seven and all those sleepless nights I had not knowing if we were going to beat them in 89 and 90. That's what makes a rivalry great. So that's why I love them the way that I do. Um, I, I, it's a, to me, that's my favorite rivalry was Detroit-Chicago, even though Boston was the bullies back then that, you know, George said they used to bully us in the Eastern Conference. Um, you know, it meant more to beat them, but fighting like that with Chicago all the time and knowing that in, two, in the year 2020, um, uh, even with this, you know, coronavirus going on, when we're all supposed to be like, you know, in unison, be rallying together, we still hate each other, even through a, you know, when the world's going to come to an end, we still hate each other. I, that's what I love about that rivalry. So game seven and pretty much everything about every game that was played back then. And, and I really think, I'm going to say it the one last time, I really don't think Magic and I, uh, Michael Jordan and Isaiah hate each other. I think that years down the road, you're going to see them talking and, and uh, you know, kind of like the way, not like the way Magic and Isaiah did, but, but Mike and Isaiah are friends. Don't let them fool you. There you go. Maybe, maybe this documentary will be that bridge where they, they, they have pressure after the Sacramento areas to, to come together and kind of yeah. you know, bury the hatchet. But uh, yeah. I want to I want to piggyback off something what George said about about team basketball and it, I think you know back then nobody personified team basketball than better than than the Pistons those bad boys Pistons because they played as a team they they played as a team they fought you as a team they just did everything as a team there wasn't any superstars on that team um, e even though you know Isaiah and Dumars and um, you know later as far as rebounding and defense Rodman but that, that those teams played as a team. And I think it's funny that Detroit basketball, even in 2004, you know, those championships were won playing team basketball. And I think that's a, something the city of Detroit can take pride in. And, uh, you know, George made a comment about Michael Jordan. He was, you know, naturally gifted, naturally kind of programmed to be, be that takeover player. And, uh, you know, Doug Collins kind of, uh, What's, what's the word I'm looking at? You know, the, he, he encouraged that in Chicago. He, you know, he says in the documentary, you know, Doug Collins would draw up plays for Michael Jordan. Their offense was go through Michael Jordan. And it wasn't until Phil Jackson came in and taught him how to play as a team and get his teammates involved. You know, that's when that team's, those Bulls teams really started to flourish. Uh, but, but my favorite two aspects of the, the Bulls-Pistons rivalry was, and, and, and don't freak out when I say this, but um, the Jordan rules, when you, when you have a team that comes together and, and forms these set of, uh, of rules as a team, like this is how we're going to play this guy, and you have Michael Jordan, who's the best player in the world, uh, the, you know, the up-and-comer in the league that's, that's dominating the league, and you, you inflict pain on this guy in a way where, where your team has a set of rules to, to slow this guy down. I mean, that's the epitome of, of team basketball. You know, the, 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 the brilliance of that team to say, okay, we're, gonna, we're not going to let him take flight. We're going to push him to his left. We're going to, you know, make him do this and this. And, and it worked. And, and they, they shut him down with those rules, playing as a team, doing, executing these things as a team. Um, I, I just think that's phenomenal of them to do that. Now, were, were they a little rough? Yes, but they got the job done. Um, the second aspect is, you know, if you really, even as a Bulls fan, you know, they, the Bulls and Michael Jordan owe the Pistons a lot. You know, it's, uh, they got to credit their success to the bad boys because it wasn't until Jordan said, you know what, I fucking had enough of this. Get you, we're, we're not, we don't have an off season. We're going to live in the gym and we're going to get strong and we're going to do whatever it takes to, to be as tough and as physical as these guys 
you know, the, the bad boys made the Bulls come up to their level. You know what I mean? Um, and you got to give a lot of credit to the bad boys about that. And, you know, it was that moment where, where Jordan says, you know, let's get in the weight room, let's, let's get tough and let's get strong so we can compete with these guys. You know, that's, that's a credit to the bad boys right there. Yeah. Um, getting back to that team thing, I have a question for Marcellus because I need a coach's perspective on this one. And I just want to know if he agrees with what Isaiah Thomas said. I'm, I'm going to quote what Isaiah said. Um, you guys know that podcast, uh, Knuckleheads, with uh, Darius Miles and uh, Quint Richardson. You ever seen that podcast? Yeah. yeah. Okay, they, they, had, yeah yep. they had Isaiah on there. And this is what Isaiah said, Marcellus. He said, uh, take a guy like Bill Ambeer, okay? A guy who was a, a, a white center, you know, that we won two championships with. Um, you know, he was a very, very intelligent player, even though that's not what people give him credit for. He was a very, very intelligent player. Um, because like, like Dan said about the Pistons being like the ultimate, like team aspect type. Isaiah said that like throughout the years and even to this day, he said, Bill Ambeer is the only guy on, on our team that didn't leave that image behind. He like still like represents our team and like the bad boy image that he portrayed back in the eighties and nineties. And he said, he said, that's probably affected his, uh, you know, maybe not getting looked at for like a head coaching opportunity in the NBA, you know, cause maybe still, maybe like people still have personal stuff against him, but mm -hmm. you know, in the WNBA, you know, three championships and uh, you know, proven winner, uh, a proven winner as a player. Do you agree with Isaiah Marcellus? that because he still represents that bad boy image and, and he wants people to think that he's still like that. And I'm proud of Lambeer for doing that. Do you feel that that could play a factor in why he doesn't get a, a look in the NBA? It definitely can, can play a factor. And I, and, uh, uh, I'll tell you, it, it works the same way for players as it does for coaches. Um, players get a bad rep and they kind of get blackballed in a way if they don't work hard or if they're, if they're perceived as uh, uh, prima donna that, that, that follows them. And Bill Ambeer, like you said, he carries that bad boys moniker to this day. I don't care about you. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about you. If I don't <laughs> like you, I, I'm letting you know to your face, you know, and we can go toe to toe if you want to, you know what I'm saying? That's, and that's what he did. And, and I do think there's some GM, or owners around the league that's like, no, nah, we can't really – because, like you said, he went to the WNBA and had success, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and usually that translates to at least a high assistant job yeah. to work your way up the level. Yeah. Now, yeah. Would, did Lambeer want a high assistant job or did he want to go straight to – I don't know. I don't know what his willingness was to, to work his way up, a la Patrick Ewing and some of these other guys that started – low-level assistance and went to the college ranks maybe and then got an opportunity so I you know I think a lot of it played but it's politics involved most definitely and you know Lambeer carrying on that probably hurt him professionally uh, post-career uh, even as like an analyst or something like you you know what I'm saying it, somebody with because Lambeer was smart man Lambeer was a smart basketball player knows the game yeah so he could have been one of those real good analysts color guy uh, yeah. to have on 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 the but he never really did a whole lot of that um nationally and that's you, you even got to ask yourself this i mean you got to ask yourself that uh, why why wasn't he why didn't he do that and, and and i'll tell you how far perception goes because dan brought up something about jordan giving homage to the bad boys for for making them lift weights well if you read the jordan rules back in the 92 Sam Smith wrote, um, who, who surprisingly is all over this documentary, and they haven't really talked about the book a whole lot. But Sam Smith wrote that Jordan wouldn't lift weights with his teammates uh, because the idea was that a lot of them could outlift him before he committed himself to it. And he was so competitive that, um, that it drove him crazy, so he wouldn't lift weights with him. So think about this. The narrative now is that he started, he led the charge in weightlifting. But we all know, like, Oakley was in there lifting weights, you know what I'm saying? Oak was in there pumping an iron before that. So, you know, it's just perception is a, is a powerful thing. And if you get that 
it can it can steamroll down here whether it's good or bad. And I think Lambeer got some bad that just steamrolled down here and it, it, it kind of upset his professional post career. Okay. Hey, that's a that's an interesting point about Lambeer too, because he you know when he did Detroit uh, coach the Detroit Shock and, and won championships with them, it's not like it's not like he implemented that system with them. You know what I mean? He, it's not like he turned the Detroit Shock into the Bad Boys Part Two. He, he coached. He was a great coach. He was a good coach. Um, he had uh, uh, Carmelo's daughter played for him uh, yeah. on the Shock. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, so played for Lambeer. Yeah, so it's it's not like he implemented that, or or you know what I mean, or tried to 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 force that style of play in the WNBA. And I, I can't remember what job it was, but I, I did I did hear his name come up as a possibility not too not too long ago for a job. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, I'm right there with you. I think I think Lambeer definitely needs a shot, and I think it could be that that teams and GMs maybe think that he's going to try to bring that style of basketball back. And maybe that's why he's not getting job offers or not getting looked, but I, I, I don't think he would try to do that. No, I think it's really, like you said, it's perceptional. Lambert did what he had to do to be an NBA player and it stuck with him. Lambert had no choice. He was non-athletic. I mean, this guy, he wasn't the strongest guy in the world. He was not weak by any, chance but he wasn't the strongest guy and the guys he had to play with during the era where the center position was a dominant position and most people were looking for scoring centers and he did a little bit of scoring don't get me wrong he he had to be he had to be smart enough to know the game know how to play knew his limitations and how to make sure that his limitations did not limit him on the court or hurt the team so I think it was it was what he had to do to survive and to make himself what he was then. I just think, like Marcellus even alluded to, it hurt him later in his career. And people looked at more of, you know, you did this, you beat this guy up, you hit him, and, you know, you backed up a lot. They don't talk about that, but Beard did a lot of backing up um, when he was in these fights. But um they see that component, the non shaking hands, and they they don't they haven't left that behind. Even though it's like we'll allow you to go in the shock, did a great job there, but it's a travesty that he hasn't has he has no affiliation with the NBA to what he could bring to some of those players that they not you know the center position now. If centers played like Lambeer now, that would be the perfect center you know for the NBA. Because Lambeer could knock down a short jump shot and everything. He could stretch you out some and hit that. He would be the perfect center. But you come in there, you know, okay, you go to the line and get your, you know, free throws, but you're going to feel me. So his style of play would actually be what you want to teach your centers now because they're not as integral parts of the team. Yeah. Yep. All right, guys. Well, this has been a great conversation. I don't know about you guys, but I had a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call it a quits right here. But um, Marcellus and George, I, I appreciate you guys being on. I know Ray does too. Uh, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of great conversation. Oh, yeah. we. I know I appreciate it for sure. You know, doing it again, it's always a pleasure. You know, with, with my brothers on here, brothers I've known one all his life, other one. You know, we've met at Central and then Dan just getting to know you just here, you know, within the last six to eight months. It's 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 wonderful, man. I appreciate it when, you know, when he threw out the idea, Sellers called me or texted me. He's like, hey, talk to Ray. Ray wants to do this. It was – it's a no-brainer for me. I mean, anytime. I think the platform is great. I love what y'all are doing. And, you know, whenever you need me, I'll, I'll be happy. Oh man, I, I you know piggybacking off George, man, I appreciate it. You know I'm the you know I'm no great athlete, uh, known athlete or whatever, but to be invited on uh, to to value my opinion is is always uh, uh, important to me, and uh, definitely definitely appreciate it. We got to do this again. When we talk old school versus new school. I'm 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 interested in getting some LeBron talk in, but anyway, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, like George said, man, this is, you know, building the camaraderie, uh, known Ray, you know, obviously since I, since high school, 
but you know, one of those things is y'all probably don't know this. George and I almost did a radio show, a satellite radio show years ago. Um, it was going to be very similar to this. So to see you guys actually do it, you know, some things fell through with us. Um, the technology wasn't there like it is now with him right. being in North Carolina and me being in Michigan to kind of pull it off like, like we're doing now. So to see this, um, is just, is, is great to see, uh, for me. And I think about those days where we were, we were trying to plan out how we we're going to do that satellite uh, radio thing and it didn't quite work out, but to see you guys doing it and, and doing it well, man. So, you know, kudos, you know, big props, man. I'm, I'm supporting, I'm supporting this channel, this, this show hundred percent. Thanks a lot, Marcel. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Um, I would think that in the future we will get in an old school, new school uh, topic. Um, one little teaser though, I will say this. I, I've said this for a long time and I still believe it. I believe that if you take the four major sports, NHL, MLB, NBA, and NFL, all four sports combined, the day that LeBron James breaks Kareem's scoring record, that'll be the most watched sporting event in the history of all four of those sports. That's all I'll say about that for now. Okay. <laughs> I was, I, well, Ray, I was going to ask you for some parting wisdom, but I think you just gave it to us. So. Well, yes. no, I got more to say. I'm going to, okay. well, I'm, I'm representing old school when we talk about old school, new school. <laughs> oh, we know yeah. what you oh, represent. We, <laughs> we already know. It is no I don't question. Think any doubt. Uh, no yeah. doubt. No, we got, we got to discuss. No, we have to discuss, is 92 Olympic team really the best team ever put, assembled? I would love to have that discussion. That's an interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting. That's interesting. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Well, it's been fun. We're going to wrap it up and say goodbye. Till next time, we'll see you guys later. And here's something we'll all agree on. Go blue. Go yes, blue. sir. Go blue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All Thank right, you guys. guys man. Nice chat with you guys. All yeah, right. good job today hosting the show, buddy. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks. All right, fellas.